teaching practitioner and uh, the presenters will introduce themselves in just a minute. This is a part, this is sponsored by the Standards Committee for AMATIC and the National Mass Summit, um, representing the organizations listed at the top of the screen, AMATIC, NOS, MAA, Carnegie, and um, the Dana Center. Uh, the webinar is going to be recorded, so we want to make sure that we reserve the right to show this again and distribute it. And by participating in this webinar, you are uh, agreeing that your contributions uh, will become part of the recording. Uh, housekeeping. So uh, this is a bigger deal when we're not using the webinar format. Make sure that you are muted. Um, by writing the chat, we already had a little screen earlier showing you how to open the chat at the bottom of your screen. And, and um, you're going to click on the arrow from panelists uh, to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can view your comments. We're going to have limited time to address your questions. So type your question in the chat. We will have somebody monitoring the chat the entire time. And we will uh, be able to save the chat and address the questions not answers during the webinar or at a later date. We, ex we don't know how many people are going to be attending. Um, I know this is right before the start of the semester, so our attendance is not super high, but we, have, uh, we believe there's going to be quite a few people on. And be kind to new ideas and uh, kind in the comments that you give to others. This is a part of the National Mass Summit webinar series, and we have some uh, webinars that are upcoming. Obviously, today's webinar is on the common vision. <clears throat> then we're going to, uh, later on, we're going to have another one um, on developmental math um, in engaging in strategies, and that will be in September. October, we're going to have one on equity. I'll, I'll post this again at the end of the webinar. And then we're going to have, in November, a professional development and department issues in a pandemic. Um, January will cover student engagement, and again, it, it is all part of our series, and we will continue to share these webinars each month with themes. Um, this is, we have an upcoming summit. Uh, the National Mass Summit is, the date has been changed, so if you knew about the previous one, the date is now June 14th and 15th. Uh, we are hoping that things will be back open, and it may be the very first conference you'll be able to attend after this. It is in collaboration with NOSTIS Conference in Las Vegas. Um, the leadership team happens to be Annette Cook, Paul Milting, um, myself, and Nancy Sattler. And then we have a variety of representatives from um, on our steering committee that are helping plan this uh, from the different organizations that have been previously mentioned. We are ready to introduce ourselves, and I am going to go ahead and say, um, I'll go ahead and start with myself, and then I'll pass it off to Annette. My name is Julie Phelps, and I'm a faculty member at Valencia College in Orlando, Florida. I am also a, the um, Standards Committee uh, Chair for uh, AMATIC. I'm a member of MAA and NOS and several other organizations. And we, uh, we are going to tell you about um, the common vision and the teaching practitioner. Look forward to doing this. Annette Cook. Yes, I am Annette. I have been a math instructor for most of my career and an administrator all total for 33 years. I am currently the NOS conference manager and executive assistant and I also work as a consultant. Denise? And I am Denise Lujan and I am from the University of Texas at El Paso. Uh, I've been in developmental education for 20 years and was the director for developmental education at UTEP for 12. And I have recently taken on a new role where I am the director of our entering student experience. I am also the NOS president. So I welcome all of you and invite you to our conference that we're gonna have in, in Las Vegas. And we were so excited when we got to change the dates instead of having to cancel. And let me pass it off to Nancy Sattler. Hi. I'm Nan Sattler, and I started teaching back in 1983 at Terra Community College, teaching both mathematics and science, computer programming, and I continue to teach today. I've had all kinds of uh, little bypasses along the way. For a while, I was chair of the math department, and then I was other things at Terra, including the dean. I retired in 2012 when I became president-elect of AMATIC. 
in 2007, I started teaching for Walden University in their graduate program, and I'm the course lead for all the master's level mathematics courses in the College of Education. Next. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of the National Math Summit. Back in 2013, we had the first summit and it was pretty much devoted to developmental math. And it was held as a pre-conference activity to a MATIC. We had a follow-up meeting in 2016. Our second summit was a pre-conference to the NAID national meeting. Our third summit, we shifted to not only developmental math, but also mathematics in general, mathematics in the first two years of college. And that was held in Orlando. And as Julie mentioned, our fourth national math summit will be held in June next year. And it is a collaborative, it is truly a collaborative of AMATIC, of NOS, formerly NAID, Carnegie Math Pathways, the Charles A. Dana Center, the MAA, and Paul Nolting. Next. So <clears throat> let's get to our discussion about our common vision. Back in maybe 2013, 2014, the MAA called together a group of people from the organizations listed on your screen, AMATIC, AMS, ASA, MAA, and SIAM. And each of these sister organizations had documents that they had created and given to their members. When we started looking at all those documents, we saw that there were a lot of commonalities. And from those commonalities, a common vision was created. The document was written in 2015 and can be found at the URL listed on your screen. And we will be sending you a copy of our PowerPoint and you will be able then to get all of that information. The title of the document is The Common Vision for Undergraduate Mathematical Sciences Programs in 2025. Next. This document had a vision and the vision is that the status quo is unacceptable that changes have to be made. And there was a call for action. And this call for action resulted in five different reasons, things that we should be doing. We should be updating our curricula. We should articulate clear pathways between curricula driven by changes in the K through 12 system and the courses that our students take in college. We should scale up the use of evidence-based practices. We should find ways to remove barriers facing students at critical transition points. And we should establish stronger connections with other disciplines. This presentation is going to focus on items three and four, scaling up of the evidence-based practices and finding ways to remove barriers. Julie and I will be discussing the evidence-based practices and Annette and Denise will be talking about the um, ways students can be successful. So the, the practices that Julie and I would like to talk about are first of all, collaboration or the use of student groups, metacognition, problem representation, project-based learning, formative assessment and figuring out what students are thinking, and the use of computer-based learning. And that can be in using self-instruction, using Zoom like we're using today for synchronous online learning, and the use of instructional tools in Des like Desmos in the online classroom. Julie and I will pre present different views. I only teach asynchronously. And Julie will talk about her experiences with teaching at a distance synchronously. Next slide. So students. one of the ways I have my students collaborate is having them create a video and they love this. And it's so easy to do because everybody has a cell phone, an iPad, a laptop, and they can record whatever it is they wanna do. 
So I challenge them to take some concept that we've taught, that, I, that they've learned in the last couple of weeks and create a video teaching that concept to somebody. And I will tell you, I've had some awesome videos that students have made. If you'd like an example of what I'm talking about, you can follow that link on your screen. Some students are very serious. Some students are hysterical. Some students create raps. It's just a great, great way to get students involved in their learning. Next slide. Another way that I get students thinking about their learning is having them do a student self-assessment after the first test that I give them. Oftentimes, particularly now as fall semester starts up, students have been off school for several months. They don't remember all the little things that they need to when they're dealing with mathematics. So they might forget, about, drop a negative sign or forget to FOIL. So I have them complete the grid that's on your screen. And you could put any item that you want as the errors, depending on the class that you're teaching. I teach college algebra, and these are the problems that I see a lot in my class. So the students will go through their test, and they will look and say, oh my gosh, five different times on this test, I forgot to use the distributive law. And then in their minds, they can say, oh my gosh, I better not do, this is what I'm doing. Now I know that I have to watch out. I have to catch myself. So it's just a great way of having them think about their errors and help them so that they don't make that same error in the future. Next slide. Another way I check for their understanding is to have them summarize the sections in the, their textbook. So this is the assignment that I would give them. And they're asked to summarize the two sections, explain how the sections depend upon the previous work, choose a problem and not one of those in the very beginning, work the problem in the section and explain the steps. And their grade is dependent upon their writing and also about the complexity of the problem. Next. So here's an example of uh, a student and he wrote about composite functions. And you can see um, writing is not his forte, but at least he is describing what a composite function is. He's showing his work. Next slide. The next one, he is explaining what a one-to-one -one function is, what an inverse function is. A one-to-one -one function is a function where every x has just one y. There are four different ways to find a one-to-one -one function. Graphing, a map, a set of ordered pairs, or an equation. A function has to pass the horizontal line test to be one-to-one. -one. He goes on to describe what an inverse function is. So he has a general idea of what the section is about. And then I know he has a general idea of what the section is about. And then he works a problem and explains it. Next slide. Another thing that I like to do is to ask students to create their own word problems. I first started doing this when I was teaching trig, and I asked students to create a problem using the sine law and the cosine law. And it had to be a problem that could relate to their life, a real world problem that they would encounter either at home or at work. And again, the students came up with some fabulous problem. Some of them I had no idea what they were describing. I could follow the math, but I didn't really know uh, the background information. But to them, it was a great real world problem. Next slide. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is the use of computer-based learning. In my college algebra class, my students use my math lab for their homework. And this is a great tool. I tell my students that they can redo problems over and over and over again. Their homework is worth 25% of their grade. And they can get 100% if by the end of each week, they have gone through the problems and corrected them all. So this is an example that you see on the screen of a problem that a student got wrong. So after the student works the problem, they click on submit grade and then the problem is immediately graded. So they get immediate feedback as they work each question. So it's not like you do a whole bunch of questions and then you find out what your answer is. 
you get the feedback immediately after you do the question. If the problem, if they answer the problem wrong, they can click on question help. And on the bottom, on the right hand side, you see the drop down menu. And the first item is help me solve this. If they click on help me solve this, the problem starts all over again. And the first thing they see is what they should be thinking about when they start the problem. And they're prompted. They give an answer. If that answer is wrong, they're prompted again. If that answer is wrong, they're prompted again. If the answer is wrong the third time, they're given the answer to that particular part of the problem, and then they continue on through the problem. Another thing they can do is click on view an example. And when they click on view an example, they get the entire problem, a very similar problem, all worked out so that they can see all the steps. The next item is textbook. If they click on textbook, they will go back to that portion of the e-textbook that discusses the problem. The one that my students like better than any other one is ask my instructor. They click on ask my instructor and immediately an email gets sent to me. And it says, and it's from their email account, so I know who it's from, they don't have to identify themselves. And it says, I'm having a problem with 4.5.101. And this is my answer, can you help me? So then I send emails back and forth and we have a discussion of the problem. The next choice is to print the problem. The next one is add a comment. And the very last one is ask the publisher. And I don't think my students use that one at all. So those are the things that I do in my classrooms to engage my students in research-based strategies. And now Julie's gonna talk about what she does in her classes. Yeah, so um, I do. Zoom. I use Zoom. I mentioned this earlier that I use Zoom, and this is. Uh, I shared this picture with a colleague or two about what my setup looks like. I actually ha can have as many as six computers running at a time, um, or iPads or whatever. Um, you'll notice that I I actually have seven in my possession that I can be using from home, and there is a reason for that. Um, I do synchronous online sessions even for um, my, my classes that don't have synchronous time slots specifically. Um, so I use Zoom a variety of different ways. I use them for Julie's awesome math sessions, which I call jam sessions. And I schedule the jam sessions and the students get to choose whether they want to attend or not. Um, and this is what the jam sessions lo will look like. I literally clone myself and I am in all the rooms watching the students work. Um, so I can physically grade their work while they're, while they're doing it. Um, I can comment. Um, I freak them out a little bit. I tell them I'm going to be using a color. It's, uh, if you've ever done paired board work in the classroom, um, you know you can literally be watching several students at once. Um, when I do that in the classroom, it's the same idea. I walk around with a marker um, that is a, a special color that nobody else has but me so that if students, you know, they look at each other's work, um, if they should know that I'm using the purple pen. Um, if, I'm, if you see something in purple, that's Dr. Phelps writing and that's what she has to say. So the students will be like, oh, we did something wrong or I might put a question mark, not sure what's happening here. Um, and I get to listen to the conversations. I will say it, it's a little mind boggling um, listening to six conversations at once, but um, I sometimes turn the volume down and just watch what is, what is happening in terms of the work. Um, I, in my jam sessions, uh, I, uh, this, this happens to be a session from this summer. I had uh, 50 students in my calculus classes this summer, and um, I, I happened to run six, uh, six, uh, peer group sessions during one of the jam sessions, and I'll show you more about what that looks like. Um, when you are doing that, so this is what it looks like, and I'm going to talk about the Zoom tools that I use. The, one of the first things, when I am first using Zoom, I think it's important for the etiquette to be something that we address. Um, so my college was kind enough to make some slides that you may want to post. I mentioned this to people as they came in, um, that the things that you put in the chat don't stay there for as anybody comes in they are not going to see those things because the chat is is a record of what happens from the time a person comes on 
and then after that, and it's their record. They only get to see what has happened for them from the time they've started um, engaging in the conversation. So there is a slide that I, I share my screen and this is one of those welcome messages that I give. And then usually this is when I'm first using Zoom with a new set of classes. Um, and uh, I set up an orientation, even for the ones that are completely online, I, I wanna make sure that I give the option of them to be able to attend a live session with me. Um, so I give them time slots where I'm gonna be going through how to engage in the course for about an hour. And in it, this will be my first slide that I use when we start on Monday. Um, in the meantime, mute yourself, make sure you know where the chat button is, test your audio speakers and your microphone, and. Uh, help them understand where all of those things are. Um, and then I talk about the Zoom etiquette, minimize the distractions in your environment so it's easier to focus, be mindful of the background noise and make sure that you participate. Um, I, I, I know that a lot of us worry about um, cameras with our students, but I post that thing saying participate and turn your camera on to build the sense of community because I don't want them to think I'm prying. I want them to understand my reason for asking them to turn their camera on. If I can't see you, like right now I can't see the majority of you, um, it's hard for me to engage and, and, and build that sense of community without that. Um, the welcome slide that I used when we started today um, this is another example where I, this is the second option. Um, this is something that I'll probably use later in the term um, as I'm having these sessions. So welcome and get to know each other a little bit better. Remind them about chat, remind them to make it so that you're not just writing just me and you're writing everybody in the group. So I, I remind them of that. And then um, one of the questions I'll probably use on the, uh, a, a, maybe the first or second day is, I really wanna know this, when we are able to travel again, where would you like to go? Um, <laughs> I, I believe that it's um, something that will help us build community and, and you know, while we're waiting for others to arrive. It allows the conversation to take place and um, they already know what I feel about the camera. So this might be my welcome slide for later on. Um, and I use it to take attendance. Um, I tell them that they have to answer this question and that's how I'm taking attendance for the day. Um, for my, uh, I have a class called Real Time Virtual. So for many of these students, they are scheduled to be with me um, from, for an hour and 15 minutes um, to take the class. And this might be how I take attendance before I start using breakout rooms and other features that this allows. So some Zoom tools. I use breakout rooms quite a lot, and I have to say that I took these with my cell phone, um, not thinking that I was gonna be sharing this with a large group, but I haven't had, since I decided to use, demonstrate the Zoom tools, I haven't really had um, sessions <laughs> with uh, students, so I'm, I grabbed these from old sessions that I have. I've gotta move this out of the way, so it's not in my way so I can see what we have here. Um, I'm gonna use, uh, you'll notice that it says uh, Zoom breakout room and it whiteboard and or share features. There um, in your, on your screen, you'll see that uh, there's going to be something called annotate. You might not see it now, but after you use the annotate feature, which I'm getting ready to demonstrate for you, once you have the annotate feature going, you will be able to draw right on the screen no matter what is happening. So do you see how I'm able to draw right on the PowerPoint? And it allows me to use a mouse, it allows me to select and, and move content, it allows me to text, it allows me to draw, it allows me to put a stamp on it. And the stamps can be anything, like I could literally be putting a question mark. Remember how I said I'll drop by Zoom, Zoom rooms and I'll, I might be asking them a question? So I might put a question mark saying, I don't understand what's happening there. Um, I might put, yes, that's right, I love that answer. Um, it allows me to do a lot of that. I can also use a spotlight. The spotlight allows me to, um, I'm gonna deny it right now because it won't let me at the second because we're in a webinar format, so in a regular format though. I might even say, just so you know, this is where I am right now. I can use the little arrow feature and you'll see that's the arrow right here. That's what I'm referring to when I say the arrow feature. And every time I'm trying to point on the screen somewhere, I can, it'll literally say what I'm pointing at. Here's how you can erase, here's how you can change your color. This is how you can undo, this is how you redo, this is how you can delete everything. 
um, and clear all the drawings on the screen. So I, I literally am using whiteboard and the students do the same. Um, you, you, you show them where annotate is located and then they're able to do a bunch. The breakout rooms are set up down here. That's where you can find where your breakout rooms, you can tell them about reactions. Obviously the chat and the participants, you can show them what all of those buttons are. As the, as the faculty member in the room, I am assigning them to breakout rooms. And you'll notice that I, for this particular one, I had four breakout rooms. And you'll see that I am in breakout room three right there. You'll see that I clone myself and I'm also in breakout room one with a different computer. And then I ha I'm also in breakout room two. And I, when I log in, I log into Zoom again, and it allows me to change my name to be whatever I want it to be. And that's how I assign myself to the room. So I actually know which room I'm in to help myself a little bit more. And I do that every time. That's how I, I clone myself. And then I'm in everybody's room and I'm using the annotate features to be able to work with students. Um, let me stop my annotate. Um, the other thing I want to show you, and let me clear my screen, sorry, annotate, annotate, clear screen. Okay. Um, I, I also want to show you that this, I, when I'm having the students work on something in my jam sessions, it's usually um, a, a worksheet or something that I've given them or something where I want them to be able to work together. You'll see that right here in the background is such a, uh, it was one of the calculus things that I had them working on. And um, I turned off my video on my iPad because um, I, I, I had a couple different devices and I don't necessarily need my students to know whether I'm looking at them or not. My, I did go ahead and put in the background a picture of myself so that when I am in their room, they can see a picture and know that I'm in, physically in their room. If not, you can have them call you. There's a ask for help feature on the screen and it's underneath all of this, but there's a little part that's a question mark where the students can click on it and call you to their breakout room if you are not physically there um, and ready to answer questions. So they can call the host to the breakout room to answer the question. Um, if the button is not showing on the screen, it means you're already in there. So don't bother, just ask and um, it works pretty well from there. So uh, I use this all the time. I've used it, I can't even tell you <laughs> how much, but my students love it. Um, I will say that in my syllabus, I now tell them that it would be a really good idea to have a touch screen computer. I realized that you could text on a screen, like literally if I, if I click on annotate and text, I can go ahead and um, see this works. Um, and all students can see that once you hit submit and it's whatever color you're choosing, it's your choice. So um, I wanna make sure that they know that they are able to share work and work together. Um, texting is not as great in mathematics. Um, uh, if it, you really do want them to draw symbols and, and show the mathematical ways of solving. So um, drawing is probably a better way to make sure that happens. That way I can draw my integral symbol. I am going to say that it's not super pretty when I don't have a touchscreen computer. This is not a very pretty integral symbol, but just go with it. Um, but that is basically what I watch as my students work together on this. So those are the Zoom tools I use. And um, I use them in my synchronous sessions and the jam sessions are non, not mandatory. They are able to come and attend if they'd like to. The other thing that I uh, use is Desmos Classroom. And I'm gonna say that this can be done synchronously and asynchronously. So I'm gonna go out to the classroom activities this is not the graphing calculator. This is another part of Desmos, so you're gonna to need to sign up and become a member. You'll actually see that um, my name is in the corner. It's free, and all of these tools are free to use. So I am giving you the link to that. You saw it in the PowerPoint. When you get that, you'll be able to click on the link and you'll be able to, um, you're gonna to have to log in, but this is, these are some of the ones just to get you started on using these tools. Um, if you are looking for other featured collections, you can go along the side here and uh, it's great because it's a crowdsource sharing idea. So it allows people to share everything. 
Um, the ones that say by Desmos were originally done by somebody else. If I, if it was done by somebody else and then I edit it, and this is would, this is one of the first activities to get them to start using it. Um, you'll notice that when you start using these tools, it tells you the way that it can be seen. It helps with, um, uh, for in your syllabus with whether they need it on a mobile or a tablet, whether it's friendly with those devices. Um, so this is tablet and laptop friendly. Um, when you are here, you're going to create a class code and this is how you're going to grade the activities and be able to follow along. This is what the student preview looks like and here's an example. So I have them introduce themselves. They're going to put, they're going to write this information in there. I like to be called. What are your pronouns? Um, and you can see that if it was developed by somebody, often they talk about the facilitation and pacing of how this can go. Um, the next one is uh, what, might, what help, might help us understand you better as a person, what is important in your life. So this is the part of the community building um, and this allows them to go ahead and literally type in whatever and you can grade it uh, at, at your own pace as well. Um, I, this one, this is what I like to drive home about having a touchscreen computer. Um, if it's possible and a lot of them use their phones when they do this I know it says it's not mobile friendly But several of them have told me that they like using their phone anytime. It's a drawing one um, Because if I'm drawing using my mouse, I still have not gotten very good at it I am surprised how good students have gotten at this But the fact is is that I still have not gotten very good at it, but this does save their content um, and then talking points, what are three algebra topics that you know a lot about? Um, something to get them starting to talk about math. Uh, tell me about your past experiences and then you can drag to the negative or the positive and have them fill out the pendulum however it is to get a better sense and tell them what's going on. Um, the scarier fun, um, I, uh, this, these are the card sorts. So like if I think dancing in public is, public is fun, um, getting called on without warning, that's pretty scary. Um, <laughs> this allows them to go ahead and go through this. And I try to pick, pick things that are not just math based. Um, and then how's class going for you so far and responding to that. So that's one of the activities. Um, I just want to show you one more and then I'm about to pass it off. Let me go ahead and go back into my collections. And let me show you about, uh, let's do the card sort for parabolas. This is about a 30 to 45 minute activity um, and it allows the students, uh, again, if I wanna make this something that my class is gonna do, I'd create a class code and I'd send it out. Um, and then here's the preview of what that looks like. Um, if I have, what is it that, if it's in standard form, what will I be able to find for something that's in standard form and what is in standard form? So um, if something's in standard form, I'm pretty sure I know what the y-intercept is. Um, if it's uh, inter intercept form or factored form, we know that we can, we're just gonna put this right there. And you're just matching uh, so that students are trying to figure out uh, what the different forms help you do. Um, and this one is an activity that's already been sorted out. Um, just wanted to show you that existed. Kind of like this one, Caroline and Andy, whose idea, who is right. Um, uh, then we also have concavities and lines of symmetry and you're gonna do your drawing. Please don't use lines. Obviously that won't be parabolic like, you're, you would have to use the pencil. And then I just kind of walk them through how to do some of these things and then they get really good at it. And then here's another card sort. Match up the graphs to the functions and you can just literally move them around and start sorting. So this is something that they could work on with somebody else by sharing their screen and the two of them can work on it together and tell me that it's the two of them. Um, but this is just something that they can do by themselves or whatever and they can keep fixing it. They can keep going back in and toying with it and fixing it. So Desmos is wonderful because there are so many options like if you look, I didn't even go and grab some of these, but here's a card sort on functions itself. Here's one on domain and range. There have been a lot that have been done and they're all free. And these can be done asynchronously and you can follow, uh, you can watch how the students progress through them. Um, and they are more of an informal assessment. So I use that quite often. And I have to say that the more I use Desmos, the 
happier I am that we are in an online world right now because I am able to model so much more. And that allows me to pass on to um, Denise and Annette. Okay, thanks, Julie and Nancy. That was awesome. My, my daughter's a high school math teacher right now, and I'm going to be sharing so much of this with her to make sure she's aware of this. Um, but in addition to what Julie and Nancy have shared, you know, the Common Vision document also talked about removing barriers that, that prevent student success. And so, as they mentioned, um, Denise and I are going to focus in on that. And as we all know, retention is a huge part of a student being successful and breaking through barriers and trying to succeed at whatever the goal is. So with that in mind, we want your input on a real quick poll question. So if you'll get to your computer, you're just gonna simply answer yes or no on your device. And here comes the question. Have you ever heard this at your institution? I was hired to teach. Retention is not my job. I'll give you a few seconds to answer, and then we're gonna share the, share the um, percentage results of who's participating, but I can tell you my answer would be yes. And, and sadly, I heard that quite a bit. Um, and you're gonna, we're about to share some research that backs up what we're saying, um, that it's really everybody's job. So Pat, what did we get there? Oh, wow, that's good. I'm glad you're not hearing that at your institution. <laughs> But it was certainly an attitude that, um, that we had to deal with where I taught at Shelton State Community College. Um, so Denise, let's tell them some of the research. Well, one of the things we all know is that, and, and the reason why we're here is because, in teaching is because we want students to be successful. And the research has so, shown that retention is increasingly our responsibility. And we, the truth is we, we want students to succeed. So we have to incorporate policies into our everyday working environment that helps students succeed and thus helps our retention. And that means everybody. That means faculty, that means staff, that means administration, it means student workers. We all need to help in, in, if we want retention to increase for the institution. The best teachers know though that learning is both personal and it's intellectual. And so this, the impact that we can have on retention is basically by what we do in our classroom. Our classrooms become the hub for us to be able to help the student persist and the student and the, and, re, and retain, keep going forward through the, and continuing on. Next slide. And one of the reasons that we want to do this is because retention is a key indicator for almost every institution out there. You've all seen your data. You've all seen it. You've all seen that they always report on retention, enrollment, and, and all of that. But retention is always there. So what happens in the classroom is a link. And it's because of what we do in that classroom that we impact retention. Next slide. So what we really want to do is focus on some of these areas where we can help in the classroom. One of them, and we're all teaching math, and so we know a lot of our students don't necessarily want to be there, but one of the best things that we can do is look at the placement. Are students in the right place? Are they where they need to be? And be aware of what those policies are at your school and within your state. Be knowledgeable about advising. Yeah, we don't have to know everything about advising, but we need to know on the courses that we're teaching and the majors that we're supporting, what do we need to know in order to help our students be aware of where they need to go and what happens. Be aware of registration and drop dates. Those impact students and their ability to continue on in the retention really is impacted by students dropping a course. And many times the students don't even understand the impact of dropping a course. So be familiar with the, the consequences to students when they drop a course. Understand financial aid. 
you know, one of the things uh, I, you know, my dissertation is on students on academic probation. And one thing that I found with every student that I interviewed was that they had no idea what academic probation meant. And they didn't make the connection between their GPA and their financial aid and whether they got on academic probation. So if, we're, if we know the policies and we understand the impact of, of when a student gets on academic probation, we can share that information. So I know, for example, at, at UTEP, we, we are very strict in our attendance and we're very strict in our policies and we drop students. And so before we will drop a student, we, there are certain questions we'll ask. We'll ask, are you on financial aid? How many hours are you taking? Um, are you working? Is that going to impact it? And, and if we get any kind of question that we can't really answer, we send them to our go-to person in financial aid or to the advisor. Because if a student is on financial aid and they're only taking 12 hours and I'm about to drop them, then they are no longer full time and that impacts their overall progression. Um, and also if you're, you know, if you're at a community college, then pay attention to the the transfers and the, and the knowledge of, of what courses that you teach and whether they transfer or not. Students typically hesitate to go find information, particularly from people that, that they don't know. So if we can gather this information for ourselves and learn this information so we can share and advise students on where they need to go and, and even get those go-to people all over campus, uh, to send students to that would benefit uh, and everyone in the classroom and it would also help with the retention. And now I'm going to pass it over to Annette. Okay, so there's no way we can look at all the barriers that students face at all of these transition points. So we're going to focus in on three that Denise and I have, ex have seen in our experience or are, are very common. Um, and then we're also going to share a little bit of research um, that, that shows how it is impactful, how it is a barrier, and then a possible solution um, to how you can address this as an instructor. Um, first of all, we, we make assumptions that we understand our lingo. Um, I have seen it happen with, uh, we don't even think about it. We use acronyms, we use abbreviations, um, but especially first generation students, they usually don't have any idea of what we're talking about. Um, I can remember as a, as a new instructor at a college after teaching high school, they were, they were rattling off things and I had no idea what they were. And I had to go to my person, you know, we all get our person <laughs> and say, okay, what did this mean? What did that mean? And so we just need to be more cognizant of that. Um, and one thing I had to do when I, when I was charged with um, building a student success center from the ground up, um, once we had students on campus for an orientation session, my job was to talk with parents because we need to kind of separate the parents, especially those helicopter parents from the students and share with them some information. And so I learned there too, you know, parents don't know that lingo at all, especially if they're brand new. Another thing is so many times people work in silos at an institution um, where I was, there was almost a, I mean, you could feel the wall between <coughs> services and student services and and that was part of my charge as well um, when I was asked to start the student success center was to create opportunities for collaboration because you know the bottom line y'all is we are all on the same team and we all should be working together to help students succeed no matter what your department is no matter what your role is and then another barrier is lack of student engagement and belonging so let's let the next slide please Let's look at, and it's often the biggest barrier quite often, that, that third one. Um, let's talk first a little bit about the lingo thing. As you see here, last summer in this second bullet, you see last summer um, a report came out that really backs this up. It said one surprising barrier to college success is dense higher education lingo. Now, um, you were sent a couple of handouts in the email right before the session started. So if you could pull up that college knowledge handout. One of them was called College Knowledge. This is something that we created. Um, I've heard about it at a at professional development that I was at. And this is where we pull together all of those things that we who work at 
higher ed institutions take for granted that students know. We just take it for granted. And so you'll see on this that it's got things like, um, what does the, your course reference numbers mean? Because sometimes it's not real clear when they're registering. Um, we had a situation where we had a main campus and like 10 minutes away was a smaller campus, but the schedule was all together. And so if they didn't pay attention to the location, they could be scheduling a camp, a course, a, make their schedule such that they got out of class on one campus at like 11.15 and had to be at the other one by 11.30. It wasn't going to happen. But they didn't know to pay attention to that location if you have multiple campuses. Um, academic suspension and probation, they usually have no, that's not something they deal with in high school. And so they usually have absolutely no idea what that really means at the college level. So our document, I've, I've made you a template that you could tweak for your own use at your institution. Um, you could even include this like with your syllabus. You could put it with FAQs. You can post it on a web page or website. We used it in orientation classes. We use it in study skills classes. If you have a first year experience course, there's all kinds of places where you can share this information and it's, it's huge. And the feedback we got once we started doing this was tremendous. I mean, it was, it was very positive and definitely worthwhile. Now let me talk just a minute about instructors sometimes not knowing the lingo. Um, Denise was talking about a while ago how sometimes students drop out. We have all as math instructors have the student that comes to see us and wants to know what have I got to make on the final to get this grade. We, we've, all, we've all dealt with it and as math instructors we usually make them do the math to figure it out. But some, and then after we talk about that, you know, many times we would have a hard conversation. Are you, are you going to dedicate the time to pull this off? Are you going to get after it? Do you think you can make that great? And I can tell you from my experience, there were times when a student answered honestly. And so my advice to that student would be, well, then perhaps the best thing for you to do is drop this class. Well, early in my college teaching career, I did not know about SAP. And SAP is related to any student getting federal financial aid. It stands for Satisfactory Academic Progress. This was not ever taught to me in my orientation for being an instructor. Um, and for some of those students, because most of the time, if a student comes to do that, a lot of times they're trying to get a C, you know, to make sure it will transfer. I was at a community college, or that's what their parents made them get to stay, you know, to pay for their school, whatever the reason. Well, I learned the hard way that many times a student on financial aid needs to make a D rather than have a withdrawal on their record. Um, same was true with veterans. Many veterans benefits have a requirement that students be in 12 hours. They lose all of their benefits. And so the 12 hours, if they dropped the class, they were below that. So sometimes an F was better than a W for some situations. So know what the status is. And also always be able to quickly tell someone where to go for tutoring. Tutoring is critical and we should be able to just immediately let them know what is the tutoring schedule, where they can find it and where tutoring is located. And then next, I wanna talk about working in silos. So um, real quickly, you see there from the AMATIC impact document, making meaningful change involves multiple stakeholders working together. And one way that we did this, we had created a community resource list. That's the other document you have. This is a template that I sent for you to, to tweak if you want to, but this was huge because we've also had students who've had life situations and they come in and they're, they don't know where to turn. They might need legal aid. They might have, have be dealing with domestic violence. And so we created this document and we shared it with all of campus. It, at first we didn't, and then we realized this should be for everybody at the college. And we, um, we just kept that handy and we update it to make sure that in, the information is accurate. And then quarterly meetings with um, advisors, like if you took the initiative to meet with your students' advisors, especially when there's a problem, I would think they'll be very appreciative of that. And it's, it's amazing how far it can go in helping a student hang in there and break through the barriers they're facing and succeed. <clears throat> so Denise is going to talk to you about engagement. So the thing is, we're all, and I love the chats over here and all the ideas that, I, that I'm, I'm seeing and reading. And you know, the truth is that we take a real look at everything. Success in our class matters. The policies that we implement matters. And when we're successful and we get students through our class, we have done our job to help the institution with 
the retention. We also know that learning is extremely personal and everyone learns in a different way and they take something differently. And, and I may present something three different ways and one person's gonna take this and the other person's gonna take another thing. And I think the, person, the personal aspect of it is where we can all grow as instructors. Data and research has shown that student engagement and belonging is critical to having students stick around. So part of what we can do is help students with that engagement and that belonging. And we do that by understanding the students and their personalities and their, their learning styles and understanding them and how to adjust our pedagogy so that students are successful. And if we do that, then students feel more like they belong and feel more like they are part of the institution. And, and I will tell you, one of the things that we've done in developmental math at UTEP is that we are very, very proactive about talking to students on an individual basis. I mean, if a student's not in my class, I text them and I'm like, where are you, right? Why aren't you here? Um, you know, and so I do get their number. We find out immediately the first week if they are working and how many hours they're taking and how many, um, how many, we know what their major is. And, and so we know the first week if a student is working 30 hours and they're taking 15 hours and they also have a child, we have an issue. So you start from week one with new plans, with a, a a game plan for the semester and help the student figure out how to get through this. And when you do that, then they, they know you care about them. And then that impacts their sense of belonging and engagement. And so we really have a couple of challenges for you. Um, one, think about your institution. Next slide. We all talk about underprepared students. Are students ready? to be here at the, at the school. We are always worried about college ready students. But I want you to twist that around and ask yourself, is your college ready for students? Are you student ready? And student ready means that we have to put a lot of forethought into our pedagogy and into our outcome, our learning outcomes and what we want students to learn and, and grow. Um, and the other thing is to challenge your philosophies. You know, when I first started working at the developmental math, we were definitely a weed out kind of department. It was my job to weed out people that couldn't hack it, right? They have, you know, to sit there and say, they have the right to fail my class, right? It took me years to change that philosophy at our department. And I, and I noticed someone earlier had said that they're trying to implement change and they have, they're struggling, they're getting pushed back. And you will and that's okay, and you make baby steps, and you make changes, and for me, it really did start to become part of our evaluation process, but it took me a few years, and then now we are that, that, that department that what can we do to help students succeed? We no longer weed out, because we believe every single person in that classroom can do this work, and belongs at UTEP, and can move forward. And so, I, you know, I just wanna leave you with this, this quote is one of my favorites from Gandhi that just says, be the change you wish to see in the world. And all of us know that the students in our classes, they can do this. They can, they belong at college and they can do this. They just, you know, and, and we have to be the person that provides them with the tools to be successful. So, we, we only have a few minutes for questions, but I saw that there were some in the chat. And um, I, I want to say that anything we don't have a chance to answer, for example, the computer requirement question, um, I plan on posting that in, um, on the, um, the uh, myomatic.org site and, and have conversations with you and, and be able to engage. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab it right out of my syllabus about what my requirements are. And I have a couple other tools for um, Zoom techniques um, that I have already posted on that site. Um, and we will make sure we share that connection and that link. Um, questions, though. Oh, and cloning. I'll make sure I post how I clone myself as well. 
um, qu other questions. Uh, we only have about two minutes. Is there is there a two minute question, Nan? There's there's one, um, Denise, probably for you that says share an example of how you engage and reach out and to students. I was, you know what? I was just about to type an answer, right? You know, here's one of the things that we did, and we changed our whole policy of how we structure our class, and we take the first five to 10 minutes. And, and I know it sounds like a lot, but it is one of the best changes we've made in our classes. And the first thing, you know, what I do is I come in and I have a random question. You know, at the beginning of the semester, it might be, what are you good at? Uh, what do you like? What, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. And I go around the room and I have everyone speak out loud and in that first, little bit you already make connections because there's people that have shared interest or something and then as you go along the semester well you start changing your questions so one day i asked the students i said what's one thing you learned about college when you arrived here and this kid raises his hand he's like he's like i'm like what is it he's like i found a new way to class i'm like I'm like, okay. you know, and so, I mean, but those are important things. And so he shared the new way to class with everybody and half the class didn't under, didn't know that that pathway was even there. Right. So it was helpful. And then another example I'll give you is near the end of the semester, I came in, I had my question already. And this one girl, I walked in and she's like, Miss Luhan. And I'm like, what? She's like, can we just talk about how stressful it is right now today? And I'm like, of course. Mm -hmm. And I could tell every single person in that room was really stressed out. I probably spent 30 minutes that day speaking with each person in my classroom about what was giving them. It was like midterms and they were all stressed out about their papers and their, the, being able to handle it all. And so, yeah, other people were doing mad, but I was, I, you know, we were having a discussion about how do you handle it? And the other people were coming up with ideas and it was one of the, best things we implemented in our class because we firmly believe also that our job is bigger than just the content that we must look and work with our students in a holistic manner and you know julie there's one question that can be real quick and then you can go on to the next slide and that is your jam sessions are they course specific <laughs> or are they for all of your students so I, um, I schedule them um, for course specific. Um, my office hours uh, are separate from that, my student engagement, but I, I have them course specific, yes. Um, because it's a little hard to do intermediate algebra and calculus at the same time. I mean, I certainly could put them in separate breakout rooms, but right now I, I, I don't know if I can do the mental shift going from statistics to calculus sometimes or whatever it's hard to make that mental shift at the same time so right now that's course specific okay thanks julie yeah um we will happily uh answer questions uh if you want to write us directly um but i do want to remind you this is a part of an entire webinar series and we our next one is coming up september 18th um it is tools and strategies for engaging developmental mathematics uh students in an online and virtual environments October 21st, we're going to be talking about equity and mathematics pathways in the era of the pandemic. Uh, professional development and department issues will be after that. Um, and then we have December off and then January is student engagement. There will be more all the way up until the June conference. So we'll be sharing those as they, as they appear and we're happy to do that. If you look in the chat from Pat Riley, you'll notice that there is already a um, link to the evaluation and the, get, being able to get your certificate of attendance. We have the contact information for Nancy Sattler, myself, Denise, and Annette. Um, and we also will say that the webinar recording and the reference links will be emailed to all. And we invite you to come to myomatic.org to see our library uh, on this topic, engage in conversations and much more. Um, this month is actually about changing the status quo and impact live on the Amatic site. And we invite you to engage in conversations with us. We will be there monitoring and looking forward to talk. And then Pat added something else. I'm sorry, I missed it. 
I, yeah. just wanted, I just wanted to say uh, the, the webinars that Julie just mentioned are all part of the National Mathematics Summit webinar series. There are other uh, AMATIC webinars coming up in the upcoming months that are not part of the series. So, so be on the lookout for all of them. Thank you. And those will also be posted on the myomatic.org. Thank you all so much for spending some time with us and getting away from your prep. We look forward to talking to you in the future. And have a great semester, all of you, or quarter. Yeah. Yes. See you in June. Yes, see you in June. Yes, yeah, see you in June. In Las Vegas. That's right. <laughs> Uh, Nancy, Annette, uh, Denise, do we need to meet or are we good? Do you want to do a quick recap or? Well, we can't right now. I mean, we can do it in a different room. Oh, up to y'all. We're down to 26 participants. Other people can hear us if they want. Yeah. <laughs> Have you stopped the recording, Pat? Uh.